Good to be with you this morning, whether you're online, uh, whether you're watching on Facebook Live, or if you're here in person, great to be with you. We, are, we live just down the road in Adel, and so this is actually the closest church I've visited yet. Uh, it's awesome to be able to be uh, 15 minutes away instead of, uh, we have about 900 miles between our furthest church north and, and south. We cover uh, southern South Dakota, all of Iowa, all of Missouri, all of Arkansas, and so uh, it's just good to be right here near home today. Uh, I would say Dave and, and Clarissa and their family are one of the greatest blessings that we've enjoyed. And probably, as I look back, one of my top one or two uh, joys of, of uh, seeing uh, people come into ministry alongside. Dave is a blessing and a joy, and Clarissa is the better half. So, uh, uh, right? <laughs> I mean, you just, and my wife's the same way. But we're in Luke chapter uh, 18, beginning at verse 9, and. I step into it today with just a, a fervent love for Christ as my Savior and Lord, and I love, I love God's Word. And so as we, as we read it together in just a moment, I want you to, to think for a second about doing a quick inventory of your heart this morning. Every one of you is in a different place. What I love about God's Word is that you might walk away from here today saying, this is exactly what God told me today, and it will be very different than the person next to you, and it will be the same truth. Because God's word is life-changing, but it's also, it's inerrant, it is powerful, but it is personal. It is absolutely what we need. You don't need thus say it, Mike, today. You need thus say it, the Lord. And so as we open God's word, I want to ask you a couple of questions. Any control freaks in the audience today? Anybody a control freak just like to kind of handle everything in your life and make sure everything is in order? Maybe you're married to a control freak. You can go ahead and nudge them right now if you're married to a control freak. Do you realize that almost every person believes that their spouse is a control freak? <laughs> Did you know that? My wife will say, Mike, you're the control freak. And I'll say, and she's probably watching this, you're the control freak. And we kind of go back and forth on it because we like to have things our own way, don't we? Anybody ever make a mistake trying to control something? Ever made a financial mistake trying to control your investments or to control your spending? Anybody ever made a relational mistake? Anybody ever made a relational mistake? Uh, yeah, thank you for lifting your hands, you guys. I appreciate it. I'm so glad as I look back that I'm married to the woman that I'm married to and not someone I dated you know, many years ago. Uh, although I may be the one she looks back and says that was my mistake. I don't know. How about a, uh, not only in the, we can do it in the workplace too. We can make big mistakes in the workplace, in the way that we carry out our jobs or the way that we pursue other jobs. We can make mistakes in our families and I'll tell you what, it's so hard because we regret them. We just, years go by and then we wonder, can I remake what I did in the past? And the glory of Christ and the glory of, of the kingdom work of God is you can't remake the past, but but he is the one who can refill it. He can backfill that in a beautiful way. And so today, my hope is that you'll do a quick inventory of your heart, every one of us, as I have, as I've looked into this, um, this word. We're going to begin reading in verse 9, if you want to follow along. Reading in the ESV, he also told this parable to some of those who trusted in themselves. That's another way of saying control freaks that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. You know what it's like when you walk into a room and people you feel are looking down on you and they treat you with contempt because maybe you're not good enough, you don't have enough, you don't look good enough, you don't act a certain way. And so you feel the contempt. And then Jesus is, is the, the great teacher, but he's also Lord. Don't, don't get lost in the fact that he's a great teacher because I know people who are going to hell who think he's a great teacher. He's Lord. And when he speaks, when he speaks, it is the inspired word of God. And it's become scripture. I could see the, the, the apostles just writing things down as he spoke. Here's what he said. Two men went up into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee standing by himself prayed, thus God that... I want to thank you that I am not 
like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all I get. But the tax collector standing afar off would not even lift up his eyes to heaven. But he beat his breast saying, God be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other for everyone who exalts himself will be humble, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. Do you know that you are not hearing that anywhere else in this world? Do you realize in God's economy, the best way to add to a sum is to take away from it? Why should you be generous with your neighbor? Because not only God commanded it, but if you truly want to understand his kingdom purpose, you're going to begin to see others in a way that God sees them. You're going to begin to understand the the obsession that God has with our humility. God is obsessed with our brokenness and humility. And I want you to know in this quick inventory of the heart, without humility, I am spiritually bankrupt. You and I are spiritually bankrupt without humility. And there is, uh, in this parable, it points out the way that God will deal with the religious who believe that they are better than. So here, here's the deal. If you think that, boy, I, I'm just so glad that I'm born into the family that I've been born into. And I, ca- I can't really say that. I was born into a family. Uh, Mom was uh, a born-again believer, but she had gone through serious uh, abuse as a child. So her, her idea of who God is as protector and God was, was very different, so I, I, I got a skewed kind of picture of that. My father was an alcoholic, um, and he was not devout at all in his faith. He would ba- barely ever walk into the doors of any church. I would be looked at as somebody, when my father died as a, a 13-year-old, when I was 13, he passed away, he died of cancer. And when he died, we literally had nothing. We had absolutely nothing. It was at that time in my life that I truly understood what it meant to be broken. When you're fatherless and you have nothing of economic means and, you, and then you begin to cling to things in this world that, that don't satisfy. I remember thinking, it, it's got to be sports, it's got to be relationships, I've got to be able to find happiness somewhere, right? You know, when you are a young person like me, and you're guessing at life, you get almost all of it wrong. I get almost all of it wrong. Listen to what Proverbs 6, 16 says. There are six things God hates, seven that are an abomination to him. Haughty eyes, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that make haste to run to evil, a false witness who breathes out lies, and one who sows discord among brothers. Do you realize in the things that God hates, are the very things that most churches struggle with. And that is, you know what? If you just raised your kids right, they would respond to Christ. We judge each other, don't we? We gossip about each other. We sow discord in our relationships. I, recently, I've just done a study on, on uh, encouragement in the Word of God, just the word encouragement. I, I would just challenge you, look up every time in the Bible that encouragement is used. Read First and Second Thessalonians. And I, I believe that in this day and age, during this time, what our nation is walking through, we need to be encouragers. The Bible says to encourage one another as long as it is today so that you are not hardened by sin's deceitfulness. If you encourage me, I, I'm less apt to walk into sin. I, I'm less apt to be drawn to it. I need to be humble enough to receive it. We told our kids when they were little, uh, confident humility is what we're, that's what we're targeting with you guys. I taught my daughter to have a strong no, and I was teasing her about this yesterday. When we left Indianola, and not only was Dave mad at me when we left, he's like, come on, I came here because I thought you were going to stay, and you, know, you still holding a grudge, or are you okay? I'm okay, I'm okay. All right, all right, we're good. So my daughter was eight years old. She just graduated from a Bible college a couple years ago. So she went from eight to now 20, what is she, 24, 25? Uh, but anyway, she is now working in a a church in Omaha. I mean, she's doing great, married to a godly guy. When when she was eight, she told me, uh, Dad, I don't want to move. And she was emphatic, I'm not moving. 
So you're like eight. We're going to you know, take you with us. Of course you're coming with us. I'm not moving. We are not moving. And I said, uh, we have to move. And she said, Dad, I have friends. And then she said, and I mean, as angry as a little eight-year-old could be, she looked right up at me and said, Dad, you don't have any friends. <laughs> you know, she was kind of right. Dave, Dave, you were my friend, weren't you? I had a friend. But when we think about that, I want to give our kids, I wanted to give our kids a strong no. I wanted them to be confident, especially our girls. I'm like, in this world, I want you to have a strong no. And they do, but they used it on me, and that's okay. But I want you to also have a confident humility. I want you to understand what humility is all about. Because God is drawn to our brokenness. He is drawn to that. And without dependence, I want you to know, without dependence, I am lost. Let's look at verses 15 to 17. Now they were bringing even infants to him that he might touch them. And when the disciples saw it, they rebuked him. Can you imagine that? Bringing these little tiny babies to Jesus and the disciples are like, come on. He needs, he's got better things to do. But Jesus called to, the, to him saying, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them for to such belongs the kingdom of God. Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. Now I want you to know, these aren't little, these aren't little people walking up to Jesus and they're bringing him and they're like, would you just hug my little two or three year old? These are infants. And there's a purpose the infants are being brought to him. And I want you to think of yourself today spiritually humble, broken, in need before God. Because these infants, without mom and dad caring for them, without someone intervening, they would perish. They would perish. There was an award-winning photo some years ago taken in Africa of a little, a little dying child all alone on a dusty road. And this child was emaciated. This child, you could see the ribs of this child. And the, the person set up his picture and his, his photograph for hours to get the right picture. And, and about eight feet away was a vulture sitting there waiting for that child to die. And somebody asked that photographer later on, he won a, I don't know what, what prize he won, he won a prestigious award for that picture. They asked him later on, what did you do for that child after that picture? And he said, I just packed my stuff up, got in my vehicle, and drove away. I didn't do anything. Not too long after that, that young man took his own life. Because he came to the place where he realized that I can win an award in this world, and yet if I am not broken and humble before my God, and if I am not seeing other people as real, and when somebody is in need and, they, and God puts them right in front of me, then I need to be humble enough, I need to be broken enough, I need to have eyes enough to do something. And if I'm not willing to do anything, then what am I here for? It's the cry of our hearts. We had a couple little uh, grandsons born a few weeks ago. They're twins. Ten weeks early, I haven't seen them yet. They're still in the hospital, and they're going to be there for weeks. And my son called me in the middle of the night, and he said, uh, Dad, emergency surgery, uh, Britt's going in. And he was sitting in the lobby by himself at 2 a.m. while one of his little babies now, his wife had been in surgery, and now his little baby's in surgery because of one of the lung issues, life-threatening lung issues, and I couldn't go and be with him. And those babies, without care, without the tender care of those who were there, they would have perished. And that is exactly what Jesus is telling us. He's saying, you need to come to me like a child. You need to come to me like, like you will perish without me. If you, don't, if you don't see Jesus Christ as your Savior and your Lord, you will perish. There is no other place you can find life. And sometimes we don't realize that until the job doesn't work out, until the kids get older and they move out, until uh, maybe someone we love is in intensive care and then they die. Then we realize 
how much we need something that's outside of this. We need a God who is, who is all powerful and mighty. Oh, I heard a little ding in my head. That means move on. There's common misunderstandings, too, of life's priorities. I want you to look at verses 18 to 30 with me. We're covering a lot of verses today, and we're doing it in a, in a period of time that will bring it in for a landing before 11 o'clock. So uh, let's keep going. Verse 18. And a ruler asked him, Good teacher. Be, re be really careful when you just say good teacher. What must I do to inherit eternal life? What do I need to do? I have the words I do underlined in my Bible because that's the wrong question to ask God. What can I do? For you to, for you to invite me into your heaven, what can I do? What can I accomplish? What award can I have? What can I bring before you, God? And Jesus said to this man, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. I love that. His questions are always uh, beyond. I'm just like, wow, why can't I ask those kind of good questions? Well, duh, he's God and I'm not. You know the commandments, he says. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Honor your father and your mother. And he said, all these I have kept from my youth. I mean, can you imagine even being able to say that to, to Jesus? I've, I've been really a good guy, and, and I don't think he's lying. I think he really has been a godly kind of person for the wrong reason. He was following the law, and he was following because he felt like he needed to keep the law. And he said, all these I've kept from my youth. When Jesus heard this, he said to him, one thing you still lack Sell all that you have and distribute to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come follow me. But when he heard these things, he became very sad, for he was extremely rich. Jesus, seeing that he had become sad, said, How difficult it is for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. For it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. Those who heard it said, Who then can be saved? But he said, what is impossible with man is possible with God. And Peter said, see, we've left our homes and followed you. And he said to them, truly I say to you, there is no one who has left his house or wife or brothers or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom of God who will not receive many times more in this time and in the age to come eternal life. Now you might be thinking, what does this have to do about Christianity, what I do with my stuff. And let me tell you, because he tells Zacchaeus to, he doesn't tell him to get rid of everything. In fact, uh, if you were to say, okay, yeah, I just need to be an ascetic. I need to get rid of everything that I have. That, that is a point when you see this. We are more like this rich young ruler than we want to admit. That's a point I want to drill home just for a second. Because we don't believe we're rich, we don't believe we're young, we don't believe we're rulers. Some of you are young, we're all rich. Do you know a, a ruler in the first century would love to have the, the kinds of things that you enjoy? When you turn the hot faucet, hot water comes eventually, right? You open a refrigerator, a light comes on, you've got things that have been kept cold overnight. You come in in your, your car, and you're not, you're not on a chariot, you're not on a horse, you've got your vehicle, you've got, you've got keys, you've got so, a way to turn that on. If you want food, what do you do? You, you get Uber Eats or whatever, just drop food off. You, you call someone, and they drop it off, contactless delivery, front door. You just make, you, you don't even have to make a call anymore, you just use your app to do it, and food shows up. Are you the rich young ruler? You better believe we are. I think the rich young ruler of the first century would say, I want to live in America in 2020. I'll go through this pandemic. I don't care. Because what they enjoy is so much more than most every other generation before us. So we are much more like this rich young ruler than we like to admit. I see in Matthew, Matthew also uh, talks about this, and he says in, in Matthew 19, 22, when the young man heard this, he went away sorrowful because he had great possessions. I can't think of one category in our life that doesn't fit into 
this kind of a first century, what a king would long for, what a, what a young ruler would long for. In fact, as uh, we drill down a little bit more, we recognize that in Jesus' economy, the way that he relates to people, love always led the way with him, always. And so I would just ask you, in this, in this time where he confronts the rich young ruler, what he's unwilling to do is say to this man that you've earned heaven. He's unwilling to say that. And that's the truth of our Lord Jesus Christ. He will not tell you this morning that your good good works will get you into heaven because that would be a lie. He also is not telling you to sell everything, give everything away, become poor in this world. It's not really even about your stuff. It's really about your heart. And in fact, this man loved his stuff more than he loved his Savior and humbling himself and asking for forgiveness for his own sin. Love always led the way with Jesus. So I want you to see in Mark chapter 10, verse 21, this same story. But Mark records it in a, in a wonderful way. A wonderful way, it says, and Jesus looking at him loved him. And Jesus looking at him loved him. How do you know if somebody loves you? Can you tell when somebody loves you? Can you tell when somebody wants something from you? I guarantee almost every woman can tell you, I know, I know when somebody looks at me because they want something from me. Sadly. How do you know if somebody loves you? I believe it's because they see you. People are, are craving someone just paying attention. Can you see me where I'm at? About a year ago, a young lady was taking some of our staff pictures, and she was a part of a church family I was a part of at that point. And she just came in and said, I'll do this for free. I'm kind of a, I want to be a photographer. I'm kind of part-time, and, but I'll do this as a gift uh, to the church. I just want to, I'll take your staff pictures. So when we were done, uh, one other pastor and myself just said to her, can we pray for you? And she was kind of taken back and, and said, uh, yeah, sure. So what, first of all, before we pray for you, what are you dreaming about? She said, well, I, I want to be a photographer full-time. I really feel like that's what God's called me to do, but I don't know how to, I don't know how to get that started. I'm kind of lost. I feel kind of, and, and you could tell that her confidence was down. And so we just prayed for her. Never met her before. Didn't, I, she was a part of the church family, but I had never met her before. At 2 a.m. that night, I got an email. And here's what her email said. Thank you for seeing me. You see, that was a really tiny thing. It was a really tiny moment in time. And I don't feel like I did anything other than what God had prompted me to do with her and for her. But for her to say, she's up at 2 a.m. and she said, I just want you to know that no one has stopped me and asked me what I'm dreaming about. I got an email from her a few months back. I did it. God opened a door. I'm full-time as a photographer, and we were able to celebrate with her. I will never see her again this side of eternity. But in eternity, what a blessing, right? When Jesus encounters people, love always led the way. It wasn't his idea. His agenda was to love them. His agenda was to lead them to a deeper relationship in himself. And without Jesus Christ, you also have to know, not only did love lead the way, but there is no eternal life without the person and work of Jesus Christ. There is no eternal life without him. John 14, 6 says, Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. Savior is not enough. He must be followed as Lord. He isn't just a nice guy that shows up and loves you and sees you. He does do that. But he is also Lord, and he can demand your heart. 
I can't demand anything of you. In fact, every time I go to churches, and I love meeting with pastors, and then I meet with elder boards, I say to them, you don't have to do anything that I'm encouraging you to do. And they kind of look at me like, why are you telling us that? And I say to them, I, I know that you know that. I just want you to know I know that. I am not the Lord. I am not lording over you. I'm not telling you what to do. How can I help you? And I do believe that in our Lord Jesus Christ, we have the one who can tell us what to do with our life. We have the one who is authority. John 17, 3 says, and that is eternal life, that they may know the one, you, the only true God, Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. And we know in 1 John 5, 20, and we know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding so that we may know him who is true. In his son, Jesus Christ, he is the true God and eternal life. The rich young ruler standing right in front of eternal life and he walks away. When our kids left home for college, one at a time, and by the way, talk about, if you guys are getting ready to leave for college, oh, I hated walking by those empty rooms. I just hated it. I'm like, I don't even want to go past the room. and I just missed them so much, Right? But when they went to college, we sat down with each one of them, one at, one at a time, and just said, I just want you to know everything we did for you, we did out of love. You don't owe us anything. We're going we're gonna to help you with college as much as we can. We can't do maybe as much as you want us to. We'll do what we can. But you don't owe us anything. Everything we did, we did out of love. I just want you to hear that. Number one, everything we did, we did out of love. You don't owe us anything. Second thing, you owe Jesus Christ everything. He made you. You belong to him. We just got to steward your life for a little bit. Man, we love you. Give your life to Christ. If you haven't already, surrender to him. He's the only one that not only sees you and loves you deeply, but he also gives you the opportunity to believe on his name and come to a saving faith in himself that gives you eternal life. And the expression eternal life is used about 50 times in the book. Well, and every single time it leads back to Jesus. Every single time. Don't miss it. This young man missed it. There's three quick, important life questions, and they really are quick. First is, what are my greatest priorities? What are my greatest priorities? And only you can answer that. And I want you to jot down a few today. What are your greatest priorities? Because in Luke 18, 23, when he heard these things, he became very sad for he was extremely rich. Our possible idols are sports and home and our vehicles and our education and our work and our family and our spouse and our kids or whatever it might be, our stuff. What are your greatest priorities? And is there anything between you and the Lord Jesus Christ? And even if you are a follower of Christ, you have to, every day we've got to think and reprioritize every single day. And the second thing, what are your, and what are your greatest worries? What are you worried about today? What's your greatest fear? What keeps you up at night? Is it the stock market? Is it relationships? Is it work? Is it COVID? What is it? What is your greatest fear? Matthew 6 says, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. And then finally, what, if you lose it, would lead you to despair? And when I lost my dad at 13, I guarantee you, I was despairing, I was angry running from God, in fact, angry, shaking my puny fist at God. What if, what if you lost it would lead you to despair? And I'm going to say something to you today that you may not, you may not believe, and I, I'm still going to say it's absolutely true. If everything were taken from your life and all that you had left were the clothes that you're wearing and no other relationships, all those people were removed from your life, your house was removed, your car was gone, your job was gone, yet you had Jesus Christ, you wouldn't have any less than than you do now because Christ is everything in life. 
There is nothing that you can have in this world that replaces Jesus Christ. Question was asked one time, if you were, if you were to be, be able to be given anything in this world and yet you would have to surrender your eternity, would you do it? Let me, let me say it another way. If you're a Christ follower, is there anything in this world that you would take and clutch and hold on to if it were promised to be yours? But all you had to do is you had to give up seeing Jesus for all of eternity and being with him for all of eternity. Would you give it up? There's no way. There's no way I would give it up. More than anything, I have a deep passion for my Savior because he not only knew me, but he changed me. I love Psalm 27, 13. I would have despaired unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Isn't that a great way for us to close today? The goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. I want you to know this morning that um, heaven is not closed. The door to pray to our Heavenly Father. Jesus is the one who, who tore that curtain. You can go right into his presence. There's no social distancing with God. You can go right into his presence. You can be with him in Christ. And I want to pray for all of you today, whether you are here listening or whether you are listening online, because I believe that God wants to do something in your life today, and he is speaking to you through his word. Father, thank you for this church Thank you for Waukee Community Church and the people that make it up. God, thank you for Pastor Dave and his family. Thank you, God, for the ministry of this church and the elders and the leadership and the men and women who serve and the worship team and everybody else that's involved. God, I pray that you would glorify yourself here. May you be lifted high for generations to come. May Christ be exalted. But right now, we need to lay something down. There's something that we're anxious about, even as a Christ follower, that we need to give back to you, Lord, that we need to surrender to you. There are things that we're fearful about. There are things that keep us up at night. There are treasures we cling to. God, help us to release them. And if anybody here doesn't know Christ as Savior and Lord, the invitation is one of humility and brokenness and repentance of sin. Repentance simply meaning I will change my behavior, but I can't do it on my own. Jesus, forgive me. Thank you for your shed blood that paid the price for my sin. I humble myself before you. And if that is your heart today, and you have received Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, begin to live with him. Talk with somebody. Ask someone to help you grow deeper in your faith. God, I thank you for this church. I ask you to continue to bless this community of believers. In Jesus' holy name we pray, amen.